Um, we're going to return to some archaeology uh, now. We have uh, Charlotte Hinodal, who, Dr. Charlotte Hinodal, who is going to be uh, talking about island identities and the centrality of the peripheral. And she's going to explain uh, what that means. Uh, she's a lecturer of archaeology in Aberdeen University, and her particular specialism is the Viking Age, that's one of her specialisms. The other is indigenous um, archaeology, which is an interesting um, combination. So she can um, understand and interpret the, the Viking Age material and all the, the Nordic stuff and the material from the Sami and the, the Inuit, which are a broad range of um, skills and interests. Um, she's also interested in uh, archaeology as a uh, resource for studying social identity and ethnicity. So, uh, shall we? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, in the later years I've been basically working in indigenous archaeology after working a lot with the uh, Scandinavian Viking Age and then especially uh, in the East. So I've been working with the Varangians and the establishment as well as the early Scandinavian towns in the uh, 8th century. Um, so, going into the West is kind of new for me. Uh, <coughs> so, this is um, very much kind of a presentation of a conceptual idea. And uh, I have to start off by apologizing for my appalling, uh, the appalling state of my PowerPoint that I will now present for you, because you know, I, I'm sure you can, most of you can relate to uh, being an academic and uh, I'm always, uh, you know, kind of working against the clock and my idea was to put the actual slides together last night but I couldn't access the internet, hence I couldn't access my, access my slides. So I had to make do with what, what was there on my computer and unfortunately I just popped to a new computer so I didn't have much uh, to, to use. So uh, basically, uh, you're going to see a, uh, a shocking lack of uh, um, maps, a shocking lack of, of proper site plans and also uh, appropriate, appropriate pictures. But you just have to imagine that they're all there <laughs> in, this, in this presentation. So um, just to start off, uh, in this talk I would discuss the acts of settling or the kind of conceptual um, domestication, if you will, of becoming a new established uh, settled community in a new land. And uh, the different uh, kind of uh, conceptual changes that these communities have to go through to become local communities, uh, to create their own identities as as a new settler community, as an island, island identity in this, uh, in this particular. Uh, and I will do this from the perspective of Orkney and the Norse settlement of the Orkneys. And uh, the reason for this being especially interesting is that islands hold a kind of special position uh, in, in, in this way. There are a lot of examples of island communities who have created did quite autonomous identities, uh, kind of standing on their own. And one of these examples, I think, uh, is very clear in, in finding in the Orkney. And um, then, as we uh, probably all know, according to the sagas, the earldom of Orkney was created uh, when the Norwegian king Harald Feinherr gifted the islands to uh, Earl Rongvald, Rongvald of Moor, uh, who in his turn passed him on to his brother Sigurd uh, the Powerful, who became the first Earl of Orkney. Um, um, <clears throat> and this gift was an act of gratitude for Rongvald's assistance in King Harald's campaign against the unruly Vikings in the West, uh, in which one of these battles, Rongvald, Rongvald's son, Ivar, was killed. Uh, so obviously this was a family affair, being the Viking Age, uh, uh, with different kinship systems at, at work here. Um, uh, and uh, these events have been uh, suggested to date to the last decades of the 9th century and they seem to agree well with uh, the archaeological material and what is later known about the Earl of Orkney. 
interesting though, uh, interestingly though, uh, it also suggests that Orkney by this time was already settled, something that is supported by the archaeological material, uh, by Norsemen who then, according to the sagas, used the Northern Isles as their base for raging against Norway, something that, of course, the Norwegian uh, king couldn't could tolerate. Uh, so, by gifting these islands to one of his uh, sworn lords, he's basically put them under his control. However, as we learn later in the sagas, and as we saw earlier today, uh, it didn't stop the uh, um, Orcadian uh, lords from their uh, fishing piracy uh, control uh, our kind of autonomous community. Um, However, this position, I, I would suggest, is gained from the geographical opportunity that uh, is given by uh, being an island community, uh, which is peripheral to the Scandinavian homelands, but also central in the important communication route to the West. So, if we take all the material together, uh, it is safe to say that Orkney had a settled North population already by the 9th century, and the great grey material, Norse type grey material, uh, dates from a, a, about 850 and onwards. And as you also all know, Orkney had, see if I have an actual slide, well, these are Viking dudes, <laughs> um, had a strategic position in the western waterway uh, and a very central mar marine location, uh, also adding to this fertile agricultural land uh, and the opportunities of, of fishing as we've seen. Uh, so we can imagine that this spot is of quite an importance. Uh, and these North people did, uh, as we all know, did not settle virgin land as happened in Iceland. Uh, they settled uh, in the land that was already inhabited and also had a very long history, very long monumental history as you all know, uh, in Orkney. And it is disputed uh, how this initial uh, settlement played out uh, as a regular conquest, basically killing off as many as possible of the native inhabitants and then kind of dominating in them into uh, to their um, Norse culture, or as might be suggested by the archaeological material, a rather more peaceful process uh, with uh, co-inhabitation uh, with the native population, then gradually assimilate, assimilated into the Norse population. Um, and there are different things that suggest uh, different ideas. We have the Norse style houses and goods that take over and replace the, the Pictish style uh, dwellings. Um, but we also have uh, a, 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 reta a retaining of the traditional Pictish, uh, Pictish style. Um, However, as we know from the written material, the archaeology, as well as the place name uh, evidence with, it, with its network of Norse names, um, we have a Norse culture that quite quickly came to dominate the Nor Northern Isles, and Orkney became this important element of the Norse world uh, with its strategic position uh, moving towards the west from, uh, from, from Norway. Uh, connecting the Western Isles, Scotland and Ireland to uh, the Viking homelands. Uh, so these early years obviously also have an important position, a role in the, in the kind of spread and consoli consolidation of Scandinavian power and Scandinavian, Scandinavian culture, at least we could uh, speculate that this is the case. Uh, although Orkney, as, you know, being this uh, island community in between these different cultures has been a land in between cultures and as such, such also had the opportunity to develop its own unique uh, um, island identity. Uh, so I will look into this early uh, settlement state by looking at the evidence of the Norse uh, settlements through the graves of the great material. Oh yeah, that's the position of, of uh, Orkney, see, really very strategic in this. Um, if you look at the North world from the perspective of the sea instead of the perspective of the land, which obviously is very uh, important. 
So, the Picts living uh, uh, in the island were um, already uh, Christian by the time, uh, and also the Norse, at least not if you believe uh, the saga material, which claims that the Arcadians did not become Christian until the forced conversion of Earl Sigurd. Uh, and again, this is supported by the archaeological material, as we do have a great number of pagan and Norse graves uh, on, on the Isles. And these finds are both individual uh, grave finds, uh, such as the famous both burial of Scar at Sunday and the uh, women's bur burial in Gurness, and uh, proper grave fields, uh, so, such as Pirol in Westray and Westness in Rossi. Uh, so naturally, these graves can be interpreted as a manifestation of the pagan belief that the people who settled here had. had and also uh, as a general practice of Norse customs. But they might also, uh, and this is what I will suggest, uh, be seen at least partially as a manifestation of a Norse identity among a new settler community. Because graves are not only an expression of devotion, they are also an act of storytelling, a storytelling within the land, within the landscape. So if we start off by the scar boat burial, uh, this burial as the first I do have a slide <laughs> uh, would uh, as the first glance seem to be a very typical Scandinavian gra uh, grave form. Uh, both burials are uh, a practice that is generally practiced among the uh, Scandinavian diaspora uh, and it's following uh, these typical kind of Norse practices all over all over this um, Viking world, if you will. Uh, so then, in 1991, the coastal erosion uh, revealed the Viking boat burial at Scar and Sunday. Uh, and this is a seven meter long boat. Uh, it has been deliberately placed in a pit. Uh, large stone has then been filled in the eastern end of the boat, uh, which created a chamber at the western end where three bodies have been placed. Uh, and these are the skeletal remains of a man, a woman, and a child. Uh, the man is lying in the west end of the boat uh, on his back with a, a proper warrior outfit with a sword, uh, a wooden scabbard, uh, in a wooden scabbard, a quiver of arrows, and then he has a comb um, and also at his feet uh, antler gaming pieces. Uh, the female and the child were uh, lying at um, uh, the east of, east of the main skeleton and uh, mo although most of the bones from these bones, uh, uh, burials were gone uh, there were some really um, amazing finds among these such as this um, um, shown in this picture um, we have two spin spindle whorls, a pair of shears, and several iron objects that might have been the fittings for a wooden box, um, which um, could have uh, contained maybe these the, the shears. Uh, we also have these, this very famous decorated wave on plaque, um, and an iron sickle, and uh, an equal armed brooch, uh, which is uh, decorated in Boris style gripping beasts that are very cute and my favourite Viking, Viking style. Um, and how this was uh, discovered, well the first find here was uh, uh, lead volume weights uh, that were found which indicates uh, that this grave has, has contained a bit of scale and this the kind of the uh, standard interpretation when you have the scales is that this person has been a tradesman or at least a, a tradeswoman uh, or at least involved in trade of some kind. So it's a very typical Scandinavian uh, boat burial but it is set in a foreign foreign setting, a foreign, foreign country obviously. Uh, so with the different ways of looking at graves uh, it's not only a way to show respect for the dead or to pro provide for their afterlife, it's also a manifestation for the living uh, and a way of making yourself present in the land, uh, immemorially. Um, 
creating kind of new traditions and uh, create a his historic presence of yourself in the future. So kind of historicizing yourself, if you will, uh, uh, in this way. Um, oh, shit. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but anyway. You know? <laughs> Great. Hello. Um, well, the, so I'm going to quickly skip the uh, uh, Broch um, at Gunnis, where we, where we have a female grave set in a uh, obvious site that's been in use for uh, a long, several uh, centuries before uh, the Norse uh, community came in here. Um, so they are using the site of an already uh, established uh, kind of monumental, if you will, landscape. Uh, and then uh, Westness in, in uh, Rosse as well, um, it uh, was uh, the first uh, excavation there, 1963, found a Viking woman's uh, with um, two oval brooches uh, dated to um, mid 9th century, Sumorphic Celtic brooch, uh, which is dateable to about 750, uh, a bronze mine, and then some more human bows. So, with fur further investigations on the site, uh, there was a find of a complete uh, waking Viking warrior uh, situ situated only a few yards from this woman's grave. And uh, with further excavations at the site, have uh, exposed 32 graves as uh, as well as earlier foundations. So, um, including two uh, boat graves. And the excavations at Westness Cemetery has revealed both pictures and Viking graves uh, of different types, uh, both with and without grave goods. Um, and this, I think, is it, it's important uh, because. The Vikings, have, uh, Vikings, the Norse people, have evidently respected the graves of the na native population uh, when burying their dead in this setting. Um, uh, Westray, as uh, another uh, burial ground which produced a large uh, amount of Scandinavian material, but it's been uh, very early excavated and very uh, rather poorly, uh, poorly uh, documented. So, we're skipping that one <laughs> into my little conclusions here. So, as incomers or new settlers, you will have to negotiate your, your way into a new community. Uh, at least, um, if you uh, stick to the more peaceful theories. Uh, and then you have to find your own place in a foreign land. Uh, and these, this can be done in, in different ways, but memory and manifestation and creating of new memories for the future, of creating of new histories for the future is one of them. Uh, and though the uh, great field of West is too badly uh, documented to make the basis for a convincing ar argument, but at least it shows that the traditions of the homelands were respected in this new environment where, where, where the Norse people arrived. Uh, the grave and possible grave field at Gurness, on the other hand, and not least the grave field of Westness in Rosse complements this story, because uh, the act of burying your dead in a previous site or cemetery uh, shows that you want to connect yourself to the previous population in some way. Uh, so in the Westness grave field, the previous Pictish uh, graves have been respected, which is an act that is not compatible with an incoming population that wants to e eliminate the traces, or all the traces of a previous population. Instead, by using these previous sites, you want to connect yourself to the previous population, become a part of their history, uh, and in the future, point towards a continuation, uh, and so on. Um, I would uh, then propose that these burials uh, would suggest a hybridization rather than an assimilation, uh, not maybe not cultural, but also in the manifestation of cultural memory, of history, of heritage, if you will. Um, and this is not an unconscious act, because the Viking Norse were people were, which were very much concerned with history and their historic legacy. Uh, some researchers have even suggested that we should view the Viking Age as a Renaissance period. Um, so. 
in creating your own identity based in this new land uh, is something that is important to any settler community. And you need to create a sense of belonging and ownership, not only. And I would even go so far as to say that this is the least important part legally, but on a cognitive uh, plane or a cognitive uh, surface. So then, the islands, which I don't have time to go into at all, um, by the identity. Um, water is a uh, unifying medium as well as a barrier. And this barrier aspect is not uh, uh, unimportant either. And with Orkney having a very strategic position as the centre of a marine culture, a land in between different people in constant contact with each other, you have a special position of actually creating a unique identity, a unique uh, advantage by just by this geographical constitution of being a space in between, kind of a cognitive liminal space, if you will, that can belong or not belong in the same time. Uh, and if you're powerful enough, uh, with strategic enough, if you will, when you choose this. So, uh, and with the, in the case of islands, I will su suggest that size actually do matter. Uh, it has to be big enough to be economically independent and small enough to be con controlled uh, and create this s sense of unity. And as an extremely quick comparative example, we can look into Gotland. Uh, smack bang in the middle of the uh, uh, North world, so to speak, where you have a very clear uh, outside uh, kind of inside perspective, if you will. Uh, it's an ext extremely strategic position. It's no doubt part of, um, of the Viking di diaspora. It keeps to the same kind of uh, style, the same kind of uh, dressing and all that, but it develops it's very unique material culture, which is more unique uh, and more diagnostic than the uh, ge more general oval brooches that you have in the Scandinavian culture. So, um, the advantage of being your own centre or periphery, so, so to speak, uh, gives the possibili possibilities of control, and not over, on, only over the land, but over the coastline, the sea, and in the lengthening the sea route. So, now I think my conclusion, so <laughs> sorry for dragging on forever. Uh, the Orcadian Norse in the early, uh, early years, I would su suggest, manifested themselves as Norse with a connection to the homeland, but also as a new community relating themselves, at least conceptually, to the native population uh, of Orkney and actively manifesting themselves as part of a continuous hybrid history for the generations to come. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, We've got time for um, at least one question. One question. Um, I, the, the farm mounds are really prevalent in Orkney where you have the picture houses and the overlaying um, Viking longhouses. I, I know, especially around the Bay region, there's been some burials within those sites and then sort of placed within the house foundations. Um, would that also, I guess, when I look at something like that, I struggle with is that a continuity with the Viking house or with the site with the Pictish underneath it? And so, um, I guess my question would be um, if there's a way to tell if. if they were intentionally going back to a pictish, like the orientation, were they respecting the orientation, or maybe was it something placed there afterwards, a house that the Vikings were responding to as opposed to the pictish foundations? Of, so I'm not sure. I think that must be like a case to case okay. uh, argument. You can't just say that this is the way, but uh, at least in, in the case of the, uh, the cemeteries, where you have obviously gone back to a, a previous burial ground to bury your dead. This is a very conscious act of relating to someone's history. And this is something that you see kind of throughout throughout time. It's not only the Viking Age and Vikings in or Norse in Orkney that, that do this, but it's a way of kind of tapping into to a previous hi pre previous history. And you see that the reuse of Bronze Age mounds, for example, in, 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 in Iron Age Scandinavia, uh, with a long kind of 
there's no continui continuity there other in them being kind of placed in the landscape so you still see them so they are monumental but I suggest at least that by going and burying yourself in these monuments you're kind of taking claim all over them and also relating your family history to this old history uh, and the Viking Age culture is a very historic, historically kind of aware culture. They, they are very much, you know, looking back backwards all the time. Thank you very much. I've got some questions, but I'll ask you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>